Welcome to Syntax, a Generative Introduction, 4th Edition. My name is Andrew Carney. I'm a professor of linguistics at the University of Arizona. I'm the author of your textbook, and I'll be leading you through this series of video tutorials. This is our third and final unit on parts of speech. In the previous two units, we talked about how you can't use semantic definitions to determine parts of speech, and how you had to use distributional ones as well. In the second unit, we talked about functional categories, and how they are a special group of items, and we talked about various different ones like determiners and tense nodes and um, complementizers. In this um, final video, we're going to talk about subcategories and features. What are subcategories? Subcategories are when you want to make a finer distinction within a category than the broad category itself. So for example, um, take nouns. There are many ways we might want to distinguish among, among nouns. We, want to, we might want to distinguish proper names from regular nouns, or we might um, want to distinguish pronouns from regular nouns. Uh, another example is the distinction between count nouns and mass nouns. Count nouns are nouns like cat, in that you cannot say cat just by itself. You have to put a determiner in front of it. You have to say the cat. Mass nouns, by contrast, um, you can just say without any kind of determiner. So for example, sugar. Of course, you can also say the sugar. Um, another difference between mass and count nouns is the fact that you can have um, which form of many or much you use. So with count nouns, you have to use many, and with uh, mass nouns, you have to use much. So we can say uh, many cats, but much sugar. Now, how do we capture these subcategories among the larger classes of parts of speech? One way we do this in terms of the mathematics and technology that we're going to employ is to mark the category with a particular feature which indicates the subtype that we're talking about. So for example, if we want to talk about the category of cat, we can talk about the fact that it is a plus count noun. And we indicate this by putting a little su subscript uh, feature next to the end category. There's, um, in the last unit, we talked about the category T. And we talked about how there's really three subtypes of elements in T. Well, we can use features to describe this. We actually need two features in order to make this work. Um, the first subcategory is the category of auxiliary verbs. Now, auxiliary verbs have a couple of properties, one of which is that you can have multiple auxiliary verbs. So you can say things like has been dancing. There we have two auxiliaries has and been. Um, those auxiliaries can also invert with a subject. So for example, you can say, has John been eating um, apples? That's an, ex that's an auxiliary construction where you do an inversion. Um, the features we use for this are maybe a little counterintuitive. We're going to call it minus modal, minus non-finite. That's because we're going to um, use the plus versions of those features, plus modal and plus non-finite, to distinguish the other two categories of T. The second category, modals, those are obviously going to be plus modal, and they're, mo and they're minus non-finite. Um, they are a slightly more restricted set of forms than auxiliaries. So first of all, um, modals can only have, you can only ever have one of them in a sentence. So you, you can't say, um, he must can leave, or he should can leave. And um, furthermore, if you do have multiple strings of items like auxiliaries and modals, the one modal must come first. So we need a special feature to identify this special class of T nodes. And we do that by marking them with plus modal. I'll take a moment uh, to step aside and say there are some dialects of English where you can have more than one modal. So for example, um, uh, in the American South, you can often say things like, 
must could or uh, uh, might could. And um, we're going to leave that aside for now. But uh, we, nevertheless, we need a notion of modals separate from auxiliaries. And we distinguish that by using the feature plus modal. Our third category of T is the non-finite marker 2. Now, it should come as no surprise to you that we mark this with the, the feature plus non-finite. Uh, because the non-finite marker uh, is the one that is the one that takes this property, it only shows up in non-finite contexts. In in more layman's terms, in infinitives, although that's not entirely um, accurate. The um, we also treat this item as plus modal because, like modals, if you have a string of T-like categories, it must always appear first. So um, just like should must appear first, and he should have been eating, um, the to marker has to appear in, in, a, in a string like um, to have been eating. So it, uh, it, pa it patterns with modals, and that's why we use the plus modal category. And so that's just an example of how we can use these feature annotations to get at different subtypes of a syntactic category. Um, we could cut the pie a different way. So, for example, um, with the tense category, we could obviously also use features to distinguish the different tenses, such as plus or minus past. Now, subcategories are most interesting uh, at this early stage in the game of our discovery of syntax in looking at subcategories of verbs. And one of the most interesting ways that verbs can vary internally is in um, what other elements they can appear with. We call this particular uh, notion of subcategory an argument structure. Now here the term argument structure refers not to having a fight with somebody, but to the number of arguments that the verb takes. Arguments is a notion from math and logic. Um, we're going to define a category that we call predicates. Now, again, you have to be careful here because what you learned was a predicate in school is not what we mean in linguistics when we say a predicate. What you learned in school as, as the predicate of a sentence was, in fact, usually what we call the verb phrase, which we'll come back to in uh, unit number three. Uh, the predicate here is typically a verb, although it can be other parts of speech as well, like it could be something like is likely, is an, uh, is an example of a predicate. Um, but it is a relation between arguments. Arguments are typically noun phrases. And about the relationship between those arguments and the real world. Arguments are the participants in a relationship, in a predicate's relationship. So let's look at an example. These definitions are a little hard to parse as they are, but if we look at an example, you'll see what I mean right away. So we have the predicate loves. That expresses a relationship between two individuals. The first individual in our sentence here is the philosopher, and the second individual um, is the class of caramel apples. Uh, the philosopher and caramel apples are arguments of the predicate loves. Okay, so those are predicates and arguments. Now, we can discuss different subtypes of verbs in terms of the number and type of arguments they take. So, this is called its argument structure. So, uh, let's take a sentence like the philosopher smiled. The verb smile takes one argument here, which is a noun phrase. It's the subject argument the philosopher. Contrast that with a verb like loves, which we've already seen, which takes two arguments. It takes a subject and an object. The philosopher loves caramel apples. And we also have uh, predicates like give. So the philosopher gave the book to the linguist has three arguments. It has the noun phrase subject, the philosopher, the noun phrase object, the book, and the prepositional phrase, indirect object, to the linguist. So verb gave requires three arguments. So here we have 
on the face of it, at least three different subcategories of verbs. Now, there are traditional names for these three different subcategories. Um, they're intransitive, transitive, and ditransitive. Where intransitive arguments only take a subject, transitive arguments take a subject and an object, and ditransitives take a subject, an object, and an indirect object. The, the names of these categories are a little surprising if you know any Latin. Because in Latin, in means no, and di means to. So if you look at this chart, that's a little surprising because the intransitives take one argument and the ditransitives take three, not two, arguments. The reason for this is that these very old traditional names refer to the number of objects that the verb takes. So a transitive um, predicate takes one object, a ditransitive predicate takes two objects, and an intransitive uh, uh, verb takes no objects. So that's the source of this in and die uh, prefixes. They're just confusing. So don't think too much about it. Just remember that intransitives take one subject argument, transitives take a subject argument and an object argument, and ditransitives take three arguments, um, such as a subject, a direct object, and an indirect object. Now we can actually refine that. So those are three broad categories, but it turns out when you push a little deeper, um, you find that there are more subcategories than just those three. That there are actually more fine-grained distinctions. Now we're going to mark those fine-grained descriptions um, exactly the same way we marked other subcategories. We're going to use features. So let's look at an example here. The intransitive arrive doesn't allow an object, okay? It, that, that, by definition, makes it intransitive, right? So we can say the package arrived, but you can't say the man arrived the package. You can't um, construct that. Don't forget that the asterisk here means that the sentence is ungrammatical. So how would we mark this? We mark this with a feature that we annotate to the category V, and that feature has the following structure. It's in the, the square feature brackets. There's an underscore which represents the position of the verb. So that underscore means the verb goes here. And the thing uh, to its left here is a noun phrase, and that says this verb must have a noun phrase to its left. That would be the subject. Nothing else is permitted. Those are the things that are allowed to appear with the verb arrive. Let's consider a verb like hit. Now hit is a transitive verb, but it only allows uh, a noun phrase subject and a noun phrase object. That's what I mean by complement here, a noun phrase object. So for example, I can say I hit the ball. You can't have any other kind of object here. So for example, you can't have a clausal object. You can't say I hit that you knew the answer. The CP here stands for complementizer phrase, which is the category we give to embedded clauses. We'll come back to that in the next unit. But critically, what you take away from this is hit requires that its object be a noun phrase and not an embedded clause. So how would we code this in features? Well, we do it very similar way. The underscore represents the position of the verb. The noun phrase on the left of the underscore indicates that there has to be a noun phrase subject, and the noun phrase on the right of the verb indicates that it has to be a noun phrase object. So this feature structure um, tells you that hit is transitive of the kind that requires a noun phrase object. There are other transitive types, however. So take, for example, ask. Ask is also a transitive verb. But it differs from hit in what it can take as its object. So just like hit, you can take a noun phrase object. You can say something like, I asked the question. But ask also allows you to put an embedded clause in there. So the embedded clause here is, if you knew the professor. I asked if you knew the professor. So we have to have a slightly different feature structure 
for verbs like ask. Now, uh, the, uh, we're going to add a piece of notation here to, or, to indicate this. Effectively, you want it to be the case that you can either have a noun phrase or a complementizer phrase, an, an embedded clause. But you don't want to have both. You want to have one or the other. We mark this by making use of curly brackets. Curly brackets in linguistics, in every subdiscipline of linguistics, mean a choice. Choose from the following list. So uh, what we have in our feature structure for ask is we have the underscore, which represents the verb, and then we have the noun phrase that's before it that indicates the subject. And then we have a choice between the curly brackets, between a noun phrase and a complementizer phrase. And we separate the, choice, the elements we can choose from by putting in a, a, a slash mark. So this feature structure says ask is of the category that it requires a noun phrase subject and either a noun phrase object or an embedded clause, clause object. Get it? Okay, we got more to go. I know this can be a little tedious, so if your brain is about to explode, pause this video, go get a drink, and come back, and we'll do the next set. Okay, if you're ready, we're going to go on. Here's spare. Spare requires one or two noun phrase objects. It requires, it can allow both of those things. So, for example, I can say, I spared him. And you can also say, I spared him the trouble. So what seems to be going on here is that you need to allow for an optional noun phrase in our subcategory. Um, now, the, here's another piece of notation. So the square brackets indicate a feature. The curly brackets indicate a choice. And now we're going to use straight on parentheses to indicate that something is optional. So, for example, in our feature structure here, we have uh, the underscore, which represents the verb. Then you have a noun phrase object to its left. And to its right, you have an obligatory noun phrase object. And then you're allowed a second object that's within those parentheses. Notice that the second element has to be a noun phrase. It can't be anything else. So that's why um, that it says noun phrase there. We're going to contrast that with a different example in just a minute. Um, and that, so let's take put. Now put um, requires a subject, and it requires a noun phrase object and a prepositional phrase as well. So you, can, uh, you can't say something like, I put the box, the book. So you can't use the, the same structure as spare. But you can say, I put the, bo the book in the box. So you can have a noun phrase and a prepositional phrase. Can you guess what the feature structure would be for this? Give it a shot. Write it down. It's going to look like this. We have a noun phrase subject, followed by the verb, followed by an obligatory noun phrase, followed by an obligatory prepositional phrase. Next, let's do another more complicated one. Here's give. Now, give has a choice. You can either have two noun phrases, or you can have a noun phrase and a prepositional phrase. That means after the verb. You also have a subject. So, for example, you can say, I gave the box to Leah. That's just like the, like the structure in put, where you have a noun phrase followed by a prepositional phrase. But you can also say, say I gave Leah the box. And there, we have two noun phrases. We have a, the indirect object, um, Leah, as a noun phrase, and we have the noun phrase object, uh, the direct object, uh, the box. So what's that going to look like? Well, we have a noun phrase before the verb, and we have a noun phrase immediately after the verb, and then the third thing which you are required to have is either a prepositional phrase or a noun phrase, and those, in the, those are in the curly brackets. I got one that's crazy. Tell. So look at tell. Tell allows you to have a noun phrase immediately after the verb, 
and then something else, either a noun phrase, a complementizer phrase, or a prepositional phrase. I told Daniel the story. I told Daniel that the exam was canceled. I told the story to Daniel. So all of those are choices, so they go in the curly brackets. These features can get quite complex. In fact, there are many, many, many different subcategories of verbs defined in terms of their argument structure. I've just given you a little taste here, and I won't torture you with going through all of them. There's actually a book um, out there called Verb Classes of English, uh, which you, you can find, in fact, all the different verb classes of English listed. Here's a few of them uh, with their features, just for, to give you a, an idea of what I'm talking about. Um, we've got one kind of intransitive, two kinds of transitives, and four different kinds of ditransitives. And like you say, there's many, many more. But we can use these fe features to distinguish among these different verb classes. Okay, now, um, that's just one deep dive into one category. We have plenty of other examples where we can use features to describe subcategories of verbs. As I mentioned before, nouns can be distinguished by whether or not they're plus or minus count, which gives you the count mass distinction, plus or minus pronoun, plus or minus uh, plural, plus or minus anaphore that were reflexive. Um, determiners, yeah, if you'll remember from our uh, video from the last time, uh, has different subtypes. So for example, they could be dictic, they could be quantifiers, they could be WH question words. And um, the same is true of adverbs and adjectives. There's actually a problem set in the textbook that you can um, have a look at if you want to see how you might distinguish among those different categories. So to summarize, within the syntactic categories, we might want to make finer distinctions than the broad part of speech categories give us. We're going to encode these distinctions with features, plus or minus count, uh, plus or minus dictic, plus or minus past. With verbs, we uh, want to really encode their argument structure. So we can encode different uh, intransitives, transitives, and ditransitives. And we do that with that complex notation of categories, underscores, um, curly brackets, and regular parentheses.